Hi, I'm Robin Myers, and I'm a Spanish to English translator of both poetry and prose. I'd like to read you several poems by Claudia Massin, an Argentine poet. Claudia Massin was born in Resistencia, Chaco, Argentina, in 1972. She is a writer and psychoanalyst and the author of 12 books of poetry. Today, I'm going to read you some poems from the second to last book called Lo Intacto, which I've translated as Intact. The book has not yet been published in English. Um, I'm going to start by reading a few lines in Spanish from the first poem, which is called Sentido Perfecto. Entramos en el dolor como quien entra en un paisaje hermoso. De repente algo que no esperábamos nos quita la respiración, nos hace detenernos y mirar. Pero ni la mirada más atenta entiende lo que simplemente existe, lo que no nos incluye, no espera nada de nosotros, no quiere nuestra conmoción, nuestra presencia. Sigue allí cuando nos vamos, sigue intacto aunque a nosotros nos haya modificado para siempre. I'm going to start again and continue the poem in English. Perfect sense. We enter pain like someone entering a beautiful landscape. Something we weren't expecting suddenly takes our breath away and makes us stop to look. But not even the sharpest gaze can understand what's simply there, what doesn't include us and expects nothing from us, doesn't want our awe, our presence. It stays there when we go, remains intact even though it's changed us forever. You ask me to detach you from your pain as a shaman drives evil from the poisoned body and to cleanse what's been corroded, the toxins, remnants, the mark life left when it dissolved into the bloodstream on the first day, malignant and inexorable as a snake bite in sleeping flesh. But all I could do, all I can still do, is give you an antidote that doesn't last and never cures. The press of skin on skin, the poor and potent human act of touch. All will vanish. There won't be any signs to show that we once met. We'll leave no proof of either the dread or the love that brought us close, of those two ties that were like water in water once indistinguishable. There won't be any eyes to conjure up the colors. We won't know how to summon back the sound of branches sifting in the wind, and not a single trace of cold scent will persist in us, dead leaves varnished with frost, and we won't be able to recover the pleasure of the berries splitting in our mouths. But even when there's nothing left, some memory in our touch will bring it back to us again, as if we'd never lost it. The moment when another life stepped into ours, certain and supple as an arrow flung in flight, and made us understand that we are matter that will meet an end, and sometimes, before ending, will be granted the grace of being hurt in such a way that makes us mortal, which means it's saved. This next poem is called Magnolia. I love the brazen flowers of summer, the kind we think are either beautiful or weird, we're never sure. Too showy, too eccentric, an explosion, a stain unfolding, white or red on green, the humdrum green suddenly burning. If only we were like that too, and not the shy and fearful people that we are, expanding in our fear as if fear were the sap, the blood, the food, the root that tethered us to earth, and somehow both kept us alive and killed us slowly, since death by fear is never quick. Years, years of fissuring and breaking off until we're just a naked stalk, defenseless. If we were like those flowers, I said to you, the day we first felt pain would be another ordinary day, and not the nucleus, the source of everything that followed, the sacred, necessary fact, the bedrock of the house we'll build to lock ourselves away and keep from being damaged once again. If we were more like them, a different day entirely would be our home. 
the day when something happened that defied the laws of logic, a thing that never should have happened, cannot happen, happens only in the movies or in dreams. I crave the violence of what shows up unannounced, the stone that cracks the mirror of the wake, the window panes, the lightning bolt that could unleash itself on any object in the world and picks your skull. I long for the encounter that will cause a new intolerable pain, uncoupling us from prior hurt as from a chrysalis, a swath of gauze wrenched off. I long for your forgiveness, to be forgiven for the things we never know, for everything we don't know how to give each other. And I long to recover later in the sun like injured horses, trampled flowers, expecting nothing but warm light on withered petals on cracked hide. I hope the coming day will not be beautiful or even happy. Please let it be extraordinary. Once, you knew, how did you know, that I was broken, shattered like a struck bone, the splinters wrecking everything, fragmenting what was whole, a detonation in the center of the earth, eternally warping the perfect cadence of what will only reach us as an echo now, reverberations, a distant call that would suffice, if we could hear it, to heal the ailing flesh, recover all of what would otherwise be irretrievable. Maybe that's the music we all carry with us, and not the constant anguished noise the words make when they want to name a thing they weren't made for. Ear to my chest, you heard the remnants of the temple once it had been cruelly interrupted, the enduring pulse. You told me what it sounded like. And in your voice, the song was beautiful, so strong it made me ancient, a frail and weary tree lashed by a raging gale. Beauty is violent. Once it slipped into your body, it won't leave you in peace, however hard you try to tear it out, stop looking at it, touching it, absorbing it, like a feral infection in every cell. You can't be cured of what's too beautiful, because your life will cling to it, and life's the fiercest, most stubborn habit of them all. It throws itself at beauty, which presents a promise of a thing we've known just once and only briefly. It offers a homecoming, a return. It vows a fire that won't consume the bedrock of the house, a house that won't close up around us like a set of claws, a hungry mouth, a body resting from its ruthlessness. It promises a time when ruthlessness won't be the only way to touch each other, leave our mark. And who would turn away from such a pledge? Origins. In the limbo between life and death, say certain holy books, comes liberation. At last, you understand. Is understanding freedom, then? Understanding as stones do, stripped of souls, light in their roughness, delivered into the passion that the elements unleash upon them, the hail's assault, the wind's sensual brush, the savagery of the sun which sears and turns them into smoldering embers until the rain blows in and licks them clean as the lioness bathes her cubs when they're born. At last, you understand, so say the books, that death doesn't exist, or at least death as point of no return. You always return. Would I recognize you if you came back as the little girl selling flowers on the streets of Mumbai, or as the agile, grim-faced buck the hunter tracks at dawn, or the monk who tends his garden in the mountains where nobody can see it, or the guerrilla fighter with the shield of explosives strapped to himself in a busy market, or the tree contorting at the cliff's edge, lengthening its limbs in search of a little sun, deformed by the strain, by the lust for staying alive? I just don't know if I'd be able to recognize you without the face, the matter so familiar to my eyes and hands. 
but I do know that as soon as I found you, the fragile ice would crack beneath my feet again, and the fierce blow of frozen water would jolt me awake, as the body awakes once it's dead, and then absorbs the electric lurch that shocks it back to life. And I'll end um, with a poem called Tomboy. I don't understand how we walk around the world as if there were a single way for each of us, a kind of life stamped into us like a childhood injection, a cure painstakingly released into the blood with every passing year, like a poison transmuted into antidote against any possible disobedience that might awaken in the body. But the body isn't mere submissive matter, a mouth that cleanly swallows whatever it's fed. It's a lattice of little filaments, as I imagine threads of starlight must be. What can never be touched, that's the body. What lives outside the law, when the law is muscled and violent, a boulder plunging off a precipice and crushing everything in its path. How do they manage to wander around so happily and comfortably in their bodies? How do they feel so sure, so confident in being what they are? This blood, these organs, this sex, this species. Haven't they ever longed to be a lizard scorching in the sun every day? Or an old man? Or a vine clutching a trunk in search of somewhere to hold on? Or a boy sprinting till his heart bursts from his chest with sheer brute energy, with sheer desire? We're forced to be whatever we resemble. Haven't you ever wished you knew what it would feel like to have claws or roots or fins instead of hands, what it would mean if you could only live in silence or by murmuring or crying out in pain or fear or pleasure, or if there weren't any words at all, and so the soul of every living thing were measured by the intensity it manifests once it's set free. Thank you.